Hello and thank you for watching my video. My name is Astrid Krasnici. I'm CCNA and CCMP certified instructor. On this video, we are covering CCNA semester 4, routing and switching, connecting networks. This is chapter 5, network address translation for IPv4. Chapter 5 is divided in five, three sections. 5.1, network address translation operation. Then we move on to 5.2, configuring NAT. Then we move on to 5.3, troubleshooting network address translation. Section 5.1, Network Address Translation, Operation. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to describe network address translation characteristics, describe the benefit and drawback of NAT. IPv4, Private Address Space. IPv4 address space is not big enough to uniquely address all the devices that must be connected to the internet. So all the devices connected to the internet, they have to have an IPv4, unique IPv4 address. Now that's not enough IPv4 addresses to uniquely assign to every device connected to the internet. So for that reason, they created this RFC 1918. They said some ranges of IPv4 addresses, they are not to be assigned to the, for the public use. They are only for the private use. So, and they will be used within the organization only. When they go to the network, to the internet, to another network, they need to be translated. So private addresses, are not routed by internet routers while public addresses are. So you have the private addresses you can run within your organization. They will still be routed within the organization, but the internet routers, they, they are configured. They, got, uh, they are configured not to allow any, any uh, private addresses to appear on the internet. Private addresses can alleviate IPv4 scarcity, but because they are not routed by internet devices, they first need to be translated. So NAT or Network Address Translation is the process used to perform such a translation. So 1918, RFC 1918 will def identify three IPv4 address ranges that were deemed as a private. So you have to remember this RFC 1918, what it does. So first we have three classes. So these addresses, they were in three classes. Class A, the address range is from 10 network. Anything that starts with 10 is a private address. These type of addresses, they are not allowed to go to the internet. You can use them as you wish inside your network. But before they go to the internet, they need to be translated. So the prefix is 10.000.4/8. Class B range is from 19, sorry 172.16.00 up to 172.31.255.255. The prefix 4/12. And then a class C range is anything from 192.168.0.0 up to 192.168.255.255. And the prefix length is forward slash 16. So here, all these addresses, any of these addresses are to be used private addresses within our network. And when they go to the internet, they need, they need to be translated to public address. So what is NAT? Network address translation is a process used to translate network addresses. Not just from private to private, sorry, private to public. You can translate from private to another private. Yeah, it's just NAT is used to translate network addresses. NAT's primary use is to conserve public IPv4 addresses. NAT is usually implemented at border network device, such as at firewall or routers. NAT allows the network to use the private addresses internally, only translate into public addresses when needed. Devices within the organization can be assigned private address and operate with locally unique address. So they never, they don't need, if they, if they're communicating with each other on local network, they never need to be translated. They're going to communicate with that private IP address. But when they, they need to communicate to another organization on another network or access the internet, then those private addresses, they need to be translated into public and globally unique address. So for example, here we have a NAT enabled on the border router. This is our border router. Everything here in our network, in our local area network, we can have a private addresses. So because in somewhere I heard the term that private addresses are not routable. That's not true at all. Because this router is gonna route the network from this to this network. Obviously, the private addresses are routable. They are not routed by internet routers because all of them, they have an access control list that says, you should never have an access source address come in. ISP will say, okay, this router will, should never send you any, any packets 
with the source address of uh, private addresses because it will deny them. So NAT terminology is always implied from the perspective of the device with the translated address. So inside network will be anything that comes up from our internal network, the addresses of the devices which is being translated by NAT, and outside address, the address of the destination device. So inside address is the address that will be translated, outside address is the destination, where you're going. The NAT also uses the concept of local or global with respect to addresses. We have a local addresses. A local addresses is any address that appears on the inside portion of the network. And the global address is the address that is any address that appears on the outside portion of the network. So local, inside, out, uh, global is outside. Inside network is a set of devices using private addresses. Outside network refers to all other networks. NAT includes four types of addresses, inside local address, inside global address, outside local address, and outside global address. So for example, everything here, it's inside local address. Inside local address. Um, let me open the notepad here for one second, please. Okay, if I have a, this is my local area network. So this is my LAN, yeah? So local area network. Now in this LAN, uh, obviously I'm gonna have a router and this router is gonna do the translation. So anything that's here in this network, it's called inside, inside, inside local address. Anything will be inside local address. Now the address that we translate to it's called inside global address, inside global address, the address that we translate to. So what address it goes from here and they get translated to this address. And then the address that we, the destination address, say imagine that we are going to this server here. And that server for us is gonna be outside local address. And then we have an outside global address as well because they're gonna have a router, yeah? So they, they will have a, a router here as well. And this router is communicated with this router here. And this router's IP address is gonna be outside global address. Right, but because for us, we're not gonna know the, uh, the inside, their inside local address, these two addresses are always, pretty much always gonna be the same the outside global address and outside local address, for us it will be the same. Because as far as they're concerned, this is, this is another network, a LAN, yeah? So we're not gonna see it anyway. Okay, so inside local address is the addresses within our network. So if I mark it here, this is our inside local address here. Everything here is our inside local address. The address that we're going to translate it to, for example, this say that we translate it to this interface, this is called inside a global address. The address that we are going to, for example, say that we are going to this web server, that's going to be the outside local address. But the web server is going to be translated to the uh, router is going to translate. It's usually going to be the same outside global address is going to be the same as local address. So there is three types of network address translation. The first type is static address translation. This is one-to-one -one mapping, address mapping between local and global addresses. With the static address translation, we usually use it for servers, um, now like a web servers, email servers, and so on. With this, because NAT was made up to alleviate IPv4 scarcity, but there's not enough IPv4 addresses, static addresses is not doing that. It's one to one. We have one private translated to one public address. It's not helping us on that, but we still need it for like uh, outside facing servers like web servers and email servers and so on. We have a dynamic address translation, dynamic NAT. This is many to many address mapping between local and global address. So we can map, for example, I don't know, let's say 100 PCs or 100 private addresses. They map to one or two, maybe 10. Uh, public addresses or we can have a port address translation where many to one address mapping between local and global address 
this is this method is known as overloading or NAT overload so port address translation is mapping private IP addresses so it's translating private IP addresses to public IP address but is mapping the port numbers as well so it's using the port numbers which with this method we can use many to one we can have one public address and we can translate all of our private addresses into that one public address for example think of a small office home office my home but inside there will be I don't know 10 10 to 15 private IP addresses and I only have one public address everything is being mapped into that the only way we can do that is using port address translation so static NAT static NAT permanently binds an inside local address to an inside global address mapping are configured by an administrator and they will remain constant typically used to configure an internal server they must be accessed from the outside world the configuration for example um, if we have a server here the 192.168.10.10 and this server's IP address this server's IP address will be translated into this IP address 209.165.200.226 uh, so for example if we are here on the internet our PC4 and it's doing SSH to that server it's going to go to the to the uh, router and to the server so always this address will be on the on our table it's a one-to-one -one mapping uh, we're not going to win on the kind of like we're not going to reduce the numbers of ipv4 addresses that we need but this is good for our service so the configuration steps the create the mapping between the inside and local address and inside global address configure using the command ip space nat space inside space source it's static then we put the inside local address and then inside global address or the address that we're going to be translated to. This is a global configuration command. And then we need to identify the interfaces, which one, which side on the router is inside and which side is outside. So the router doesn't really know what is inside and what is outside. So we have to define, we have to tell the router which an interface is inside. It's, it's pointing towards the inside network and which interface is pointing towards the outside network. So this is an example. For example, IP NAT inside source, static. So we put, we put here static configuration. Um, the address of our server, the private address 192.168.10.254. And this address is going to be translated to this public address, 209.165.201, sorry, dot uh, five. So the clients, for example, when they want to HTTP or SSH to that address, the server, the router will forward them to the web server and then on the root on this on the router s000 for example here this one here we given a private IP address different network you can see that's a cloud and we tell we say that okay well this interface is inside it's pointed to our towards our inside network so as far as the router is concerned everything now here it's inside local address the address that we translate into it's inside global address. To verify the static NAT example, even if there's no communication, this is going to soon as we do show IP NAT translation, it's going to be there. This address of the server will be translated to this address. After we have a session, active session, something is happening, so the communication is happening, we can see the translation to the outside local and outside global address. To verify the static NAT example, we clear IP NAT statistics and then when we do show IP NAT statistics we can see that we have one static NAT configured we don't have any hits so nothing has been no communication after the PC establishes session with the web server then we do show IP NAT st statistics we can see that we have one still static NAT configured and now we have a uh, five hits there so static NAT uses one-to-one -one mapping of local and global addresses. These mappings are configured by the network administrator and they will remain constant. Static NAT is particularly useful when servers hosted on the inside network must be ac accessible from the outside network. A network administrator then can use SSH to a server in the inside network by pointing the SSH client to the proper inside global address. Dynamic NAT is used, uses a pool 
of public addresses and assign them on the first come first serve basis. Now this is very important. First come first serve basis here. Okay, so we create a pool. For example, say in our pool we have a 10 uh, public IP addresses available for our 100 private addresses to be translated. Now, first 10 addresses they will be translated successfully. The 11th private IP address that wants to be translated into public IP address has to wait for one of the addresses to be released. So it's pretty much like a like a uh, dynamically one to one. So we have 10, well, only 10 devices can actually uh, be translated at a time. First come first serve. If the 11th device has to it wants to be translated, it has to wait for the one of the devices to release that translation. When an inside device requests access to an outside network, Dynamic NAT assigns an available public IPv4 address from the pool. Dynamic NAT requires that enough public addresses are available to satisfy the total number of simultaneous user sessions. Yeah, important thing here. Because if we have only 10 and we have 100 users or 100 private IP addresses that have to be translated, the other 90 they have to wait until one of them gets released and so on. One thing that we have to remember for dynamic NAT is first come first serve basis. So to configure dynamic NAT, the first thing that we need to do is to create an access list, which we define which addresses they should be translated. So what we're doing with this, with this access list, we are saying the network 192.168.11, so network 192.168.11, which is net this network here, should be translated. So we're permitting them. This network, 10, don't allow it. That's an access list that says, okay, a source, as long as they're coming from that network, they should be translated. And then we create the pool. We say IP NAT pool, give it a name, whatever name you want. The addresses of our public addresses that we have purchased, 209, 165, 200, 226. So from 226 to 240, we have purchased these addresses. They are ours to be used. And then we give a net mask. This net mask will be given to by your ISV or whoever you got this IP, this NAT from. And then we need to define to bind the pool to an access list. So we have to bind the NAT pool to this access list one. The command is IP NAT inside source list. Source list is one. So access list one. Pool, NAT pool. So we bind an access list one from here to this pool. NAT pool one. And then the last thing is to do is to define what interfaces are inside and what interfaces outside. So as far as router two is concerned, this interface here, so let me just point it, this interface here, it's inside, and this interface here is outside. Very fine dynamic NAT example. For example, we need to clear IP NAT statistics. And after the PC2 established the session, show IP NAT statistics. We can see that we have one dynamic NAT and the pool. So we can see the pools, the start IP address and the end IP address. Network address translation advantages and disadvantages. So advantages of NAT, for, exa for example, the main advantage is that it con conserves legally registered addresses, increases the flexibility when connecting to internet, and this is like later on they find out, oh, this is a good thing as well. We are hiding our own local IP addresses or inside IP addresses from the outside users. So we inside, we can use any IP address that we want. Outside users, they will not know about this. This can handle network with overlapping addresses, eliminates the address renumbering as network changes. The disadvantages of NAT is the translation might introduce switching path delays. So while we are translating the IPv4 addresses, we are introducing delays, loss of end-to-end -end IP traceability, so you can't trace from the source to destination, we don't, we can't trace it. Certain application will not function with NAT enabled. Uh, for example, some, some protocols, they don't like to see the addresses or the, the packets being manipulated on the transit. Uh, they see it as loss of integrity. And this requires memory to maintain translation tables. It does require memory, extra memory in the router to maintain the table. Thank you very much for watching this section, 5.1, Network Address Translation Operation. Please have a look at my other videos and don't forget to subscribe. This has been Astrid Krasnitschi. 
I hope to see you in the next video 5.2 configuring network address translation. Bye bye.